I have heard uh, David speak on several occasions, and uh, and we, we've known you guys for what about eight or nine years now, something like that, through the Science Cafe, and uh, it's been a couple of years since you spoke uh, the first time in the pulpit, I think, David. But in all this time, I have been hearing these wonderful things about Ginger Fox, and and she's like. Um, a, a, a Wonder Woman going and I think had like five Sunday school classes at one time or something like that and you know this man over here loves you to death and he thinks you are the most awesome girl in the whole world because he brags on you all the time. I don't know if you realize that or not. He's my PR agent. He's your PR agent. There we go. Perfect. And I was so impressed when when we've talked in the past that you ran a business and it was in um, uh, uh, reinforcing buildings, is it, am I remembering that correctly? And um, steel, build, steel construction, steel erections, and, um, and uh, reinforcing, stabilizing buildings and stuff. And uh, I just was so, I've always been so impressed with everything I've heard and now, you're under pressure now because now it's, you, you're going to see it for the first hand for the first time. And I've been so waiting and so excited. So, I appreciate so much you coming and agreeing to speak. And so, I'm going to, without further ado, uh, welcome Ginger Fox up. And let's make her feel very welcome. <laughs> is going to be reading some of the scriptures today. So we got him. Is your microphone working there? Yeah, well, no, it's working. Too. Yeah, yeah. She, she was my lovely assistant. You can have a lovely assistant too, can't you? I do. Okay, all right. If there's, do you need anything? Need some water? Or, well, uh, anything? Okay. David, yes, put the mic down. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We, we've, already, we've already figured this out earlier. And it also, we figured out it needs to go back about, about six inches. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good, because my voice is not strong. You're doing well. Can everybody hear at home? Say something, Ginger. You didn't tell me your mother's name. Her mother, her name is Ruby. Ruby. Ruby, yes. Hello, Ruby. And uh, so, all right, can everybody hear okay? Just nod your heads. Can you hear Ginger okay? All right, good deal. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is compliment her on the crush back here. The outfits oh. and all that the shoes done is beautiful. It's very beautiful. Yeah, with the uh, Christmas decorations. I'll have to take a picture of it before I leave. Okay, I do have a prayer if you would bow with me. Father, let the words of my mouth and the attitude of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How I thank you. How I thank you. And in Jesus' name I thank you. Amen. Amen. Dr. Foss, would you read either one first? Doesn't matter. We're going to read Psalm 23 and we're going to read Psalm uh, John 10. It's in your bulletin. You can follow along with him. Um, and we're going to talk about sheep. Okay, first Psalms 23. This is a psalm that David wrote. This is from the version NASB, New American Standard Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the name of, for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, 
for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Certainly, goodness and faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life, and my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to pause for a minute to let that word of God sink in, and then we will read from John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. However, a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus told them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what the things which he was saying to them meant. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All those who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock which, with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it back. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. Dissension occurred among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, He has a demon, and he is insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the words of one who is demon-possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes 
of those who were blind can it. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. We read it. We read about the shepherd and we just sort of read it. I have to tell you a story, a quick story, when I was in high school, maybe ninth grade. I was leaving with the quarterly, I was leaving children. I love kids, they're so honest and so bold. And I was telling them, it's the first time I told the story of the Good Shepherd. And I was telling all the kids, I said, you're God's sheep. And he, does, he tells you what to do and you follow him and you're his sheep. The kids were about anywhere from five to seven. And Tommy looked up at me and he says, I am not a sheep. Well, I was in the ninth grade. It's kind of difficult to know what to do. But I said, yes, you are. You don't argue with the child. But I did. I said, yes, you are. God says you're one of his little sheep. I am not a sheep. Yes, Tommy, don't argue. You are a sheep. He said, I am not, I am a jackass. <laughs> that ruined it. <laughs> that took Sunday school and made it all the kids, you know. <laughs> so after church, I said to his grandmother, I related this story to her, and she said, oh my goodness. That's my fault. She said, I got him all ready for church in his little suit. And he was so, looked so good. And I sent him to the car in the driveway. And I went back in for my pocketbook. And she said, I told him, Tommy, you stay right where you are. Stay clean. We're going to church. He got in a mud, she came back out with her pocketbook and he was sitting in a mud puddle and she said, Tommy, you little jackass, get in here. So he, he, he wasn't a sheep, he was a jackass. But we are sheep. God says we're sheep. And we, we don't really understand that fully. But these two portions of scripture are probably the clearest and dearest um, rendition or ex explanation or um, fact of what Jesus is to us, what he does for us. Um, he's telling a story of sheep and shepherd to explain what he is in reality. Um, to understand what he's saying and how it affects us, we have to look at the audience he was speaking to and the culture that he was addressing. He was addressing Eastern culture. He was addressing um, he was an Easterner. He was an Oriental. We got to remember that. And to understand what he's saying, really, and how it affects us, really, we have to get into that culture a little bit and see what they think, what he's saying. That's actually um, how he's addressing his relationship to his children. A sheep herding was one of the most income producing uh, entities or pers uh, not jobs, I'm not thinking of jobs, endeavors, we'll, we'll use endeavors for a better, lack of a better word, uh, in the Orient. <coughs> They're everywhere. Um, and second only, maybe first, they run a neck and neck with the winery, with the grape industry and the making of wine. Um, and in Jesus' time, 
That's what he's addressing. He's, he's leaving that with, um, he's, he's addressing the sheep herding to tell them, try to get across to them, and as we've read, there was a division among them, okay, when he was talking. And he's trying to get across to them what he is, who he is, and how much he loves them. And we need to see in that how much he loves us and what he does for us. It's not a new endeavor in John. And you know, we use Psalm 23 for comfort so many times when somebody dies or even when somebody gets married. Um, we use the 23rd Psalm for comfort. It, it opens up meetings, it, but I'm not sure. I know that I didn't take it. I didn't know what it really was saying to me until I got into Eastern culture. And then I could tell what God was actually saying. Um, now, sheep herding is not a new in, uh, endeavor when Jesus was there because it started with when the first people that were on the earth, Abel, you remember Cain and Abel? Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Abel was a keeper of the flock. Sheep have been there all the way through. From the times of Abraham until today, it is still a very prevalent income producing uh, endeavor. In fact, the measure of one's wealth in Orient and in Bible times was often measured by how many sheep you owned. Job owned 14,000 after his um, trial with Satan. He started out with seven. Satan wiped that out. But God always comes back with double or nothing. He comes back with double, more than you ever even thought about. I think about heaven. That we have no idea what's in store for us. God says so in Corinthians. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Nobody even in their wildest dreams knows what he has prepared for us. But we'll find out if we're his child. Um, Solomon sacrificed 120,000 sheep at the dedication of the temple. That showed the importance that Solomon put on um, God. He gave everything he had almost. I don't know if he had more sheep or not, but I think it probably was about 120,000. That's a lot of wool. Um, Isaiah 46, 11 says, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. Speaking of Jesus, speaking of God. Um, and even in Revelation, you see that the lamb is standing. Jesus is the lamb there. So she followed from Abel, to God. They're everywhere. So it must be important. Um, the sheep must be important and we need to know exactly what God is doing uh, with us. The promise of the shepherds that, uh, that's found in Isaiah 46 11 says, like a shepherd he will tend his flock. And then there's false shepherds you know. It starts out, uh, we're mentioned in Zechariah, I'm going to raise up a shepherd, woe to the worthless shepherd. Now, let's look at the shepherd. 
that Jesus says he is. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When I was growing up, and up until not too long ago, I thought the rod was there for correction like my mom's switch. I thought it was to keep me in line. And she used to say, this hurts me more than it does you. And I used to say, Mom, don't hurt yourself so badly. <laughs> Let me suffer. <laughs> um, and I've got a lot of stories about the switch um, that no, we don't need to hear. <laughs> anyway, that shepherd's rod is not, just, is not for correction. He's not going to beat us to death. That shepherd's rod is for protection. And it's the forerunner of the king's scepter. The king's scepter was for protection. And the rod is there to drive away that what they were hearing was wild animals, all the enemies, the hirelings, anybody that would rob the sheep, take a sheep away from him. It's there to drive him. And sometimes it was a, it was a long stick and it had a ball kind of on the end. And most shepherds made their own rod. And sometimes they would drive nails in it, which made it a more formidable weapon. Which I thought the nails in the cross made him a formidable weapon. Um, I, I, I'm always, may I take this off and walk around? Absolutely. I can't stand still. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm animated a little bit. The shepherd's staff, on oh, this side, the shepherd's staff is like a, it's like E.T. You remember E.T., the movie? It comes up and bends over. Well, that's like, and you see it with Moses, and then they had a staff, and it came up and had a crook in it. Its purpose for the shepherd, main purpose, was if a sheep got lost in the brambles, or it got to wandering away, or it went off to play, and it wouldn't behave, he could take this crook and gently pull this little sheep back into where he wanted it to be. If it was in the brambles, he could separate the brambles and pull this little sheep. And what is that for us today? Anything, anything that will keep us from following our shepherd. It might be something that looks good, but it's not. And God will gently pull us back. And the more we learn of him in the word of God, the easier it is for him to pull us back. And the less it hurts. I know that, you know, when you have a puppy dog and it's got this little uh, harness on, the harder he pulls, the more it chokes him. But if he stays closer, he's free. He's free to roam. He's free. This is the same way with the sheep. This is what God does with the sheep. He pulls it and brings it back into the fold. What happens to the sheep if he can't behave? What happens to us if we can't behave? But we are God's sheep. Now, we're talking about believers here. We're not talking about just the culture or the people that are out there thinking they're good and they're not and they've never met the shepherd. Never met him. I'll tell you, I had a Damascus Road experience. That's a Tamara Road experience where I lived when God zapped me. But what God does, what Jesus does, what the shepherd does in Eastern culture is he takes the little sheep, he breaks its leg, and then he sets the leg, and then he puts it in a, a wrap and holds it close to his body and his heart until that little sheep heals, until that leg heals. How many times have in your life had your leg broken? And you wonder why. 
God is holding you closer while you heal than you've ever been before. Just like this little sheep. But this is actuality. We think of sheep herding in, um, in our culture with cowboy boots and jeans and horses and, and uh, dogs and other people and we drive the sheep. They didn't drive the sheep. And what he wears, everything a shepherd wears, everything, has a purpose. He has a big camel hair outer garment. It serves as a bed. It serves for warmth. It serves to help with the sheep. Everything he does, he has a tunic on. Um, and tunics are talked about in, in the scripture. Jesus wore a tunic. It's a sort of a, it's just a white or white or light garment that's loose. I remember my grandma used to wear one. I thought it was a tunic. Um, kind of like a, what are those things, boas? Those loose fitting um, outfits that they wear in, in the Orient. Galilean? What? I think it's called a Galilean. Yeah, yeah, one of those. It's a Galilean. Whatever it is, it's, it's just a loose fitting garment. And he has a leather girdle around his, the middle. He has a script box like David uh, wore. David, you know, was a shepherd. And he has a little box there with a little script around there. Sometimes it has fruit in it. And as he walks around with the sheep, he'll pick up fruit or buckberries or something and put them in there for his food. Because it's, it's uh, what, what his mom put in there probably has been already eaten. But this is what David also car uh, carried his five stones in when he was killed the lion. He has, um, okay, we're also used to in um, Western sheep herding, not just the jeans and the boots and all, but they drive the sheep. God never drives his sheep. Jesus is a good shepherd, and he goes before his sheep, as he says. Um, that's John 10. I call my sheep by name. Let's go there. He knows his sheep so well, and the sheep know him so well that they follow him, and they know his name. And he actually, in actuality, the shepherd names his sheep. And if his, if his flock is not too big, he will name all of them. Black, it was some, according to some character uh, trait that they have. Cripple, he might have a crip, he might have black ear, spot, or whatever the Orients named them. But they know him. This is actual truth. When they go in at night, they, he builds, he builds, or there has been built by another shepherd, a big circle made out of briars and brambles, and it has no door. His sheep go in. That's the only time he gets behind them, is when he ushers them in to the sheep gate, full sheepfold. And he lays in the doorway. He is the door, as it says in John 10. I am the door. He has a certain call for his sheep. The shepherd does. The sheep know his call. And in this sheep gate, if there's other shepherds and other sheep in there, the shepherd, each shepherd can go to the gate and call, make some sort of call. I think like Yuhu, Tahoe, or something. And every sheep in there, there might be 500 sheep or 5,000 sheep, and each shepherd owns a portion of those sheep. Those sheep, when the, when the shepherd gets up and calls his sheep, 
Only his sheep come out. The other shepherd's sheep do not come out. Only his sheep come and come out by him and go out to graze. And God says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me and they follow me. He can tell his sheep by touch. He can tell, he knows his sheep. They all have a different, something different about them, even in a large flock. He knows his sheep and his sheep follow him. Um, he goes before them, he guides them. As he goes down, my sheep, um, when they went through the grain fields, sheep were forbidden to go into the grain fields. There's places that we're forbidden to go as God's sheep. We're forbidden in scripture and by our own conscience. The little sheep are not indifferent. Sheep are forbidden in the grain fields, of course, because they would decimate the grain fields. But there is a little path through the grain fields. And the shepherd goes, starts through the grain field, and his sheep know to follow him. He doesn't put his feet in the, in the grain field. They don't put their feet in the grain field. He leads them right through there just really carefully. And he doesn't have to go back and say, here, get back in shape when he goes through the grain field. They follow him, and he, he can lead them. Psalm 23, he guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He guides them between the grain fields where they're forbidden to go because of himself, because he guides his sheep. When they cross streams of water, which I would like to, to um, sort of equate that with, with um, problems in life, smaller problems. When they go across the streams, they all go from one side to the other, of course, and then, if one or two starts wobbling around, and it looks like they're not going to make it or get some good footing, he gets in the water with them, and he goes and picks them up and brings them back to the flock. He's always rescuing his sheep. If one of them starts to wander, he can pick up some pebbles and throw it just beyond that little sheep and it will come back and God warns us the same way um, the sheep fold <coughs> sometimes there's a sheep fold in front of the courthouse the, um, temple building the temple courtyard those are for sacrificial lambs. Only they go there. I don't know about you, but it's really difficult. I'm not a Jew, and it's really difficult for me to even think about sacrificing a lamb. It's even harder for me to realize that Jesus, as the Lamb of God, was sacrificed. I will tell you this, from the, from the get-go, the um, early sacrifices in the temple and on, when a person sinned and brought their sheep, their sacrifice, to be sacrificed for their sin, they had to rip the throat of their own sheep. They had to kill it. Now, if you don't think that's a deterrent for sin, there's something wrong. Because if, even my dog, if I thought if I sin, I had to slit her throat and raise tears to my eyes. 
It would prevent me from sinning. This is what Jesus sacrifices to do for us. Prevent us from sinning and realize that this lamb, this perfect lamb on the cross, I slit his throat. If that doesn't keep us from sinning as far as we can possibly imagine, then we need to, as Paul says, test ourselves and see if we be in the faith. Um, I can't tell you how many things, well, I could, it would take all day, um, how many things that God was saying there. Let me get back over to John and address it. He who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. He calls his sheep by name. And when he puts forth his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And he is, he goes on down and he says, I am the door. And Acts 4.12 says, Nobody comes to the Father but by me. God sits in the doorway of the sheepfold where we are. It's, it, think of the Ten Commandments as a love fence, as a sheepfold. And realize that when we stay in that sheepfold, we are free. And Jesus is the door to that sheepfold. That love fence of Ten Commandments. And there's only one way in and one way out, and it's the Master's voice. I like to tell this story because everybody has a home. Now, we have homes now with a front door and a back door and sometimes a side door. So it's a little hard for those outside the circle to realize what it means to have Jesus be the door because there are hirelings in our life that come in other doors. But if you have a door, and, and you say who comes and goes in your house, she says, God is the one that thought of heaven, and everybody wants to come their own way. There is only one way, and that's through the shepherd. But if somebody comes and knocks on your door, and you open the door, and you say, you know, come in. I don't want to come in this way. Well, this is my door. Please come in. No, I don't want to come in your door. I want to come in over here, but there's no door over there. Not into my house. Well, I brought my chainsaw. And what I'm going to do is make my own door and come in your house my way. That will not work. You will not allow that. Jesus is the door to the sheepfold, and he is the only, only, only way. Let me put you, I did bring some pictures of the door of the sheepfold. Either day, I say David, get up. <laughs> I think there's one, two, three, four, I think there's five there. A picture sometimes is worth a thousand words. Um, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And this is exactly what Jesus did. But let me tell you, there are shepherds who have died in the Orient, protecting their sheep. 
And then kind of sometimes I'll read up. Um, the shepherd's dress, the shepherd guides, sheep fold. Um, pardon me. I forget this has sound on it too. <laughs> The Good Shepherd is telling the people in the Orient, and they know exactly what he's saying, but they do not know the spiritual ramifications of it. They know exactly what a shepherd does. The shepherds are there at the um, birth of Jesus. They were so special that God sent angels and heavenly hosts to let them know, let the shepherds know that Jesus Christ was born. Now the shepherds were at least 90, 60 to 90 miles away from the birth, from the cave. They had a long ways to go. So they said, let's make haste and let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing, this baby. I don't know what I would do, I don't know what you would do, and you don't know what you would do. Actually, if God showed up with heavenly hosts like he did with Ezekiel and, and different people in the scriptures, they saw this. The shepherds saw, and they believed. And that's another story, but they made it. And then they were the first witnesses when they got there and they saw this baby and they realized who he was, I don't know if he had a light around him. You know, a lot of times it shows Jesus with this little halo around it. And it's not crooked like mine, it's straight. But they knew who he was. They knew who he was because of the announcement. And they went out and told everybody. They went out and they told everybody that the baby was born. When you come to know Jesus and you believe and you realize you're his sheep, and all the things a shepherd does for his sheep, he leads them, he guides them, he knows their name. And this is in actuality, as we just talked about it. He guides them, he leads them, he, he leads them beside still waters. You know how hard it would be? Yes, you do. To go by something that you wanted and needed. I know when I pass a cookie, I want to just pinch off a little bit and take a bite. I know it's not good for me. But when we walk, when his sheep walk by the waters of life, they follow him. They don't jump in the water. They follow the shepherd. And he says, I'm the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. There's nothing with Jesus that's not good. But when you pass by something that you want to do, that you used to do, um, I know when I got saved, all the invitations that I used to get from parties. I was a designated driver. I'll just have to admit this few things here. I ran with a group, group, group of people that were what they call social drinkers. But, I, you know, they really acted funny for just social drinkers. But I drove them around. Um, and I know that when I came to know Christ, all those parties left. I was so happy my family thought I was in a cult. And they, they would, you know, it was just really pitiful. They wouldn't listen to me, one side of the family. One side of my family was religious and the other side was whatever. Um, they thought they were Christians, I think. And maybe some of them were, I don't know. Nobody ever talked to me about Jesus in the family. We went to church and did all that. 
And I went as a Christian and nobody ever challenged it. I taught Sunday school with the kids and all that, and nobody ever challenged me. But all the party invitations left. Nobody wanted me as a designated driver anymore. And I thought, what is going on? The people I thought were my friends are gone. They're not asking me out. They're not invite me on the boat to go to the ball game or or on the trips to go to the bowl games or whatever. And God showed me, in all your ways acknowledge me and I will direct your path. What was happening was God was removing all these rocks and stones and everything out of my path that I might be his sheep and walk the straight and narrow. And I had to do without them, even music. At the end of the day, I would be exhausted. And I realized, it's a long story, but through a process, I realized that the songs that I was playing on the stereo, even though I wasn't conscious of thinking of things, but the music was affecting my body and my soul and my head, and it was, I don't know if there was a war going on in my head or what, but I was exhausted at the end of the day. And through what I thought, what I believe God was telling me, was turn off that kind of music. And when I did, I wasn't tired anymore. You see, so many things affect a sheep. And I don't know that, the people say that sheep are dumb, but I don't think they are. I think sheep are just focused. They're focused on the shepherd. And they, they, they won't do what the world wants them to do, so they think they're dumb. We're not dumb. But I tell you this. Um, pastors of churches are considered shepherds. and they shepherd their flock. They're not better than, they're the same as, but they shepherd. They shepherd their flock, and they're responsible for it. And God calls himself the good shepherd. Now prepare us to table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runneth over Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. But if you never remember anything about sheep and shepherd and sheepfolds and sheep gates and sacrifice, remember that the Ten Commandments, the commandments of God, are a love fence. And if we stay inside that love fence, which I'm calling a sheepfold, it's all, it all points to the same thing. It all points to the love of God and the shepherd of God and the son of God and the sacrifice of God. And if we stay in that love fence and we don't lie, cheat, steal, we don't commit adultery and murder, even in our heart, God says we don't have that even in our heart. We're not to gamble and run outside the, the sheepfold. But if we stay inside that love fence that, and consider it a sheepfold, we're free. We're not pulling on the reins. We're free and the good shepherd can work through every one of us. Every one of us has a gift. Just like God, the good shepherd says, I know my sheep. You know, as a sidebar, I'm going to have to hurry. As a sidebar, I want to tell you just a little thing I have found about shepherds and sheep. There are five men, and, and this is how, we've all been born for a purpose. 
if we're God's children. We've been born again for a purpose. To glorify our Father who's in heaven. To be his sheep. That's your purpose. To be conformed to the image of Christ. And what God will do to get that done, we've got to be submissive. We've got to work toward it. Our part is to follow. His part is to lead. His part is to call us by name. And when we start over here, I know quickly God, how God talks. In Hebrews, it says, God spoke in, in, in olden times in the Old Testament, I'll call it, in prophets and miracles and things like that. But in these days, latter days, which we're living in, he spoke to us in his son. We need to listen to his son. And I know that David, my husband's body hurts a lot. And we bought this big biomedic vibrator to save my hands because I run his back and his legs. And this vibrator does it. And one night I was so tired. And I knew I couldn't go to sleep if he was hurting without helping. And I was rubbing up and I was praying. I was saying, David, I think I've told you this story. I was saying, God, I'm so tired. Please make it work quick. <laughs> let, let this help in a hurry. And God said to my heart, inasmuch as you've done it under the least of these, you've done it unto me. Jesus got the best back rub he's ever had. I tell you that. That very night as I rubbed David, I figured I was rubbing the back of Jesus. Not, don't take that to heart. <laughs> I don't think you're Jesus. But you got his back up. I've got to go. There's so much more about a shepherd. And I will maybe do it some other time. But never forget, that little white woolly thing is us. And we need to follow him. And the sheepfold are the Ten Commandments. And we walk in there, we fall him in there, and we're free. And he is the door. There is no other way in and no other way out. And when we have a problem in our life, remember God breaks our leg to bring us back where we belong. But while we're healing, I know my mother said when she was dying with cancer, she said, I said, Mother, this is not fair. And she said, God's calling me aside. God's calling me to his side. Whatever problems we have, don't get mad at God. Work them out and stay in the sheepfold. Because God has you closer to his heart than ever before. Thank you so much.